Thanks, Eric. Uh, it's, it's really great to be part of this wonderful celebration and to see so many friends and, and colleagues all gathered together. Uh, like Bob Jarrow, I received a clear set of marching orders from Zvi. Uh, I was to speak about the relationship between the fields of economics and finance and to reconcile any tensions between the two uh, over the course of lunch. Uh, <laughs> Unlike Bob, I basically pushed back on my mission and said, uh, this is lunch, come on. Uh, and no slides, uh, no discussion of Edo calculus, and a few stories, and then we'll talk a little bit about the interplay between economics and finance. Uh, so uh, I want to start uh, by, in some sense, representing the MIT economics department, which is incredibly proud of its distinguished graduate, Bob. Uh, I think Jerry Hausman is also here in, in representing our department today. Uh, our department has never hesitated to bask in the reflected glory of Bob's accomplishments. Uh, when Ben Bernanke came to MIT in 2006 to deliver the commencement address, uh, he began his talk by explaining to the gathered MIT community, much of which had no idea we had an economics department, I suspect, uh, that MIT, in fact, had been teaching economics since the 1880s when Francis Amasa Walker was president. Uh, but he also pointed to the accomplishments of economic research and the way this had transformed the world. And what he pointed to was the work that led to the financial economics revolution, in some sense, uh, that began in this building uh, with uh, Bob and Myron and Fisher Black. And I'll actually read from Ben's 2006 uh, speech, which was, the global financial industry has been transformed by quantitative approaches to pricing complex financial instruments, such as derivatives, and to managing and measuring risk. This transformation stemmed from the application of the formal tools of mathematical economics by the faculty at the Sloan School, including Fisher Black, Bob Merton, and Myron Scholes. Right? And that was kind of how we were explaining the way in which economics, for someone who didn't know what this was, uh, really helped to go out and, and, and have consequences for industry and commerce in the wider world. Now, uh, that notwithstanding, right, as you heard earlier this morning, it was not a foregone conclusion that Bob Merton was going to go to graduate school in economics, uh, since he applied to, I think, six different places and was only admitted by one. And Harriet mentioned the word serendipity. Okay? There's a wonderful book by Robert K. Merton and Eleanor Barber, which is called Serendipity. And it, it, it is, serendipity is not good luck. Uh, serendipity is a, a trained observer uh, finding something they weren't expecting to find while doing something else, right? So when a scientist discovers by their powers of observation and then deduction that something else interesting is happening in their experiment, that's serendipity. It's not just kind of the gods gave you a good role and something happy occurred. So I was trying to fit together this serendipity. And by the way, the serendipity book, which was published in the early 2000s, was written by Robert Kay and his co-author in the late 1950s. So that's, talk about sitting on a manuscript. Uh, that was quite a bit of a distinction. But the key thing in some sense with the serendipity, uh, and I'll come to this later, I don't think Bob getting to MIT in the economics department was serendipity. I think it was just a bit of random good luck along the way. And I've tried to dive into this question of, you know, what was it MIT saw that led them to admit Bob and give him a fellowship when everybody else rejected him? Uh, and this is, by the way, not a department that has a great record in this regard. The MIT Admissions Committee in Economics had decided not to offer a fellowship to Ken Arrow in 1948 after interviewing him, deciding he had sort of strange preferences for what he was going to work on. Uh, so, you know, this is not a place that always gets it right. Uh, so, I, Bob points in his Nobel memoirs to the role of Harold Freeman, uh, who was an MIT econ faculty member. He was a statistician. He was also a couple of years ahead of Paul Samuelson in graduate school at Harvard. And Harold Freeman was on the admissions committee that admitted Bob. Okay? And Harold had been an MIT math undergraduate. He worked on statistics. During the Second World War, he hung out with Abram Wald at Columbia and did statistical sampling and various things. And I think he probably stayed in close contact with the MIT math department in various ways. Well, it turned out that one of the people, who again Bob points to, as a central figure in his experience at Caltech, when he decided he was going to abandon applied math and go to graduate school in economics, is somebody named uh, Gerald Whitman, Gerald Witham. And Witham is a British mathematician, applied mathematician, uh, who was then the head of the Caltech Applied Math Department, but who had been an MIT assistant professor for three years in the early 1960s. 
So I think, and I can't prove this, but we'll work on this later to see if the record bears it out, that the crucial bit of good luck was that Witham happened to know Freeman, and that Freeman therefore spotted this letter from someone who he trusted saying that this was a really great student who wanted to do something that he thought was crazy, which was to become an economist. Uh, but he thought he backed it up as much as he could. Okay? Now, the other key thing, I mean, it turns out this Harold Freeman was really important for the growth of the MIT economics department. Harold Freeman, as I said, was a couple of years ahead of Paul Samuelson in grad school. He had actually convinced the MIT economics department in 1939 they should make an offer to this mathematical economist named Samuelson. And that lobbying, plus a bit of anti-Semitism and anti-mathematical economics at Harvard, uh, brought Samuelson to, econo to MIT in the first place. Ten years later, Harold Freeman had the idea that they should go and talk to Vasily Leontief, who seemed to be advising most of the best students at Harvard, uh, and see who was his best student and make an offer to him. And that was a kind of simpler economics market for PhD students. So they did. And they asked Leontief who was his best student. That turned out to be Bob Solo. Uh, and then 20 years later, uh, he's central to, to admitting Bob Merton to the, to the MIT PhD program. Uh, so we all owe a great debt, more than he is typically credited to Harold Freeman for economics and finance here, uh, here at MIT. Okay, now I want to fast forward to Bob's arrival at MIT, uh, and this is Bob telling me the story. Uh, so Bob arrived on the first day for registration at MIT Economics, and Bob Solo is the graduate registration officer. Uh, as he tells it, there was a long line outside Bob Solo's door as students were getting ready to register. <laughs> there was another door next door, and there was no line there. Uh, so arbitrage in action, he walked through that door to see what was there. That was Paul Samuelson's office. <laughs> So the, 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 the Samuelson-Merton connection begins uh, early on, and this is the point, I think, where serendipity comes into play, because Harold Freeman convinces Bob that he needs to take Paul Samuelson's mathematical economics course, his first day in at MIT, and Paul, at that point, realizes the gift that the gods have brought him and very quickly turns Bob into his research assistant and then his collaborator. So that's, in some sense, the beginning of the, of the interests that I think uh, bring us to this, to this very exciting moment. Paul would have loved to be here as part of this celebration, uh, not least because he would have gotten to write papers for another 10 years. Uh, but uh, we do actually have Paul's work on uh, descriptions of, of Bob and his critical role. Pa Paul Samuelson wrote the preface to Bob's continuous time uh, finance book. And I'll just read you the tribute. Robert Merton is known as an expert amongst experts. I am proud to have figured in the Mertonian march to fame. One of the great pleasures in academic life is to, to see a younger savant develop, evolving into a colleague and a co-author. And then, best of all, <clears throat> the rare sight of a companion at arms who forges ahead of you, okay, as you were able to do at that inflection point in your own career. Right? From Paul Samuelson, that's pretty strong praise. Right? And I know that that, in some sense, would be echoed uh, looking at the remarkable accomplishments today. Now, when you, when you read Bob Merton's descriptions of how this all came to be, at least I always feel there's a kind of aw shucks, you know, the Edo calculus, the contingent claims analysis. It was just kind of there to be picked up. Um, there's a little moment, uh, and in fact, it's the, the Samuelson-Merton interaction here that I want to play on, uh, where maybe we get a little bit more insight on this. Now, Bob edited the third volume of Paul Samuelson's collected works. Joe Stiglitz had edited the first two volumes, and then Bob was given the, the, the task and responsibility for the third. And in that context, okay, there's one paper in that collected works, which is the joint Samuelson-Merton 1969 paper on warrant pricing. And do I have any uh, Liam Neeson taken the action movie fans in the audience? Anyone recognize that movie? Yeah, okay. I want to make sure before I get to the punchline here. Um, the, in, in all of the other papers, as best I can tell in that volume, the third collected works, you just sort of see the paper as it appears in the journal, and on it goes. There's a note from the editor before the paper on warrant pricing, okay? And what the note says is, uh, the analysis here is very complex and can be extended beyond warrant pricing to other types of securities. Further elaboration of the theory and its application is supplied in two appendices. Good luck. 
<laughs> so I, I think we see a little bit of, you know, Bob at least at that point recognizing that really something pretty exciting and important had happened uh, in figuring out how to do some of this, uh, some of this work. And I, I thought that was a little endearing as I, as I discovered it. Okay, one last story before I come back to the pr proposed theme of economics and finance. And this comes back to the, the 1969 seminar at, at Harvard uh, that you heard briefly mentioned this morning, the one where Arrow comes up at the end and says, I didn't quite know how to do this. Um, I, and this is from Paul Samuelson's rendition of this workshop at Harvard. Uh, and, uh, and it tweaks our, our Harvard neighbors just a little bit in the process. So Paul described this seminar to me as the inaugural meeting of the Harvard Mathematical Economics Seminar at which uh, it being Harvard uh, and it being that era, uh, the, the leading lights of the department, so this would be Arrow and Leontief and Hautacker and Jorgensen and others, were gathered in the seminar room and they were seated close to the front at the big rectangular table. And then a little bit further back were the somewhat more junior members of the senior faculty. And a little bit further beyond that were the assistant professors seated at the table and then off to the sides on the camp chairs were the graduate students who were choosing to attend this workshop. And Paul, Paul Samuelson has been invited to be the speaker for the first workshop. And apparently Paul, and Bob will have to confirm this, but I hope it's all true. Paul began by saying, looking at the way the audience was arrayed, uh, our speaker today uh, will not be me. Uh, it will not be a full professor. It will not be an associate professor. It will not be an assistant professor. Uh, rather, it will be one of the graduate students who's back in the bleachers. Uh, so I'd like to introduce you to Robert Merton, my co-author for this paper, who will do the presentation today. Uh, Paul Samuelson clearly enjoyed the opportunity to provide that introduction. Uh, and of course, we know from, uh, from Zvi's description that the seminar went brilliantly uh, and, uh, and, and, and things, you know, the, the rest in some sense is history. Uh, but I think that the little bit of extra history on that, on that seminar is kind, of, is kind of neat. So, all right, let me come now to, to talk a little bit about economics and finance and the interaction uh, between, between the two. Uh, because, you know, Paul Samuelson did a lot to bring finance into economics. He was very interested in financial topics. In fact, he used to say that uh, the stock market and personal finance are the catnip uh, that attract people to introductory economics. I've always translated that as that's the chapter that sells the introductory textbook. Uh, but uh, but he, he liked connecting these two things. And my general theme will be that Bob has played an incredibly important role in continuing that bridge building uh, between finance and, uh, and economics in the decades since then. Okay, so you know, I, I think it, it's, a, it's a difficult game to try to define finance versus economics. Uh, I wouldn't take a stab at it, but fortunately, uh, back in the days of the yellow-covered NBER working papers that had white holes in the middle, uh, Stan Fisher, who was one of Bob's office mates in graduate school, and Bob wrote a paper that was called Macroeconomics and Finance uh, and tried to think about the, the differences and similarities between the two. Uh, and they actually offer a definition of finance, which I think is, a, is one I will certainly embrace, as the study of household behavior in the intertemporal allocation of resources in an environment of uncertainty and the role of private sector economic organizations in facilitating these allocations. Right, so that kind of tells you what's in. I think if you think for a bit, you can think of lots of things in economics that are out. And you know, that gives you some way of, of defining the territory here. Okay? And in fact, uh, their paper was kind of a lament that a lot of economics, and macroeconomics in particular, was ignoring the work in financial economics, particularly the role of the stock market, as a key pricing mechanism which mattered for macroeconomic outcomes like investment and consumption and other things along those lines. There's actually a really wonderful passage in which they describe in a different way, more practically, the difference between finance and economics. This is kind of macro modeling of the day. You know, the, we're trying to explain consumption sort of things. Again, this is Fisher and Merton. In traditional macro, the emphasis is on the explanatory variables, and the residuals are treated as noise, which preferably would not be there. By contrast, in finance, it is precisely the noise that represents the uncertainties that significantly influence economic behavior. In short, if there were no residuals, then there would be no subject to finance. Right? So in some sense, you can think about you know, which of these two things you're bouncing back and forth between. And I think that this was 1984. Right? If you were simply to ask today how the 
economics or the macroeconomics versus the finance has fared, I think you would conclude, hands down, that finance has won. Right? If you were to go to a macroeconomics conference today, what you discover is that the events of the last 15 years have turned virtually all of the macroeconomists into, at least many of them, into students of financial intermediation and imperfect credit markets and the system which intermediates between the household sector, the financial, the corporate sector, and then brings in the role of various government policymakers who set macro pro policies and other things like that. If you go to a monetary economics conference, you discover uh, that since most of the unusual monetary policy of the last decade has involved trying to use various policy tools to inflate asset values in the hope that the asset value inflation will then spill over into real behavior like higher consumer spending, that the macro and the monetary economists have realized they have to understand the determinants of asset values in order to figure out what's going on. Now, that's an oversimplification, but I think it is absolutely clear that over the last, the period since this paper was written, uh, there's been an enormous shift toward integration between finance and macro. The consumption cap M, uh, related ideas have in some sense, the Q model, have all driven basically the, the field of macro toward the key concepts and key insights of, uh, of financial economics. So I think I mean, my, my core theme to, 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 to sort of demonstrate this afternoon is Bob's work is very much in the spirit of bringing economics into the picture and trying to connect the financial economics topics with the economics topics. And essentially what I mean here is there, you know, there's some questions in financial economics which are largely within finance, right? They could involve relative pricing of securities. Uh, they could involve the market microstructure of the securities markets. Uh, they are questions where, you know, the things that, say, a macroeconomist or, or a labor economist would think about do not immediately intersect with those questions. But Bob's work, while it certainly brings the toolkit and, of course, develops the toolkit of financial economics, uh, is, 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 is squarely within finance, it also almost always reaches out to grab these bigger economic topics and pull them in and show where the, the insight is on those topics. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of try to make the evidence for my case in, in three or four different ways. I'm going to start with the theory of intertemporal portfolio selection and optimal consumption. Right? If you go back to the classic papers in the late 1960s, the 1970s, the work that's in Bob's dissertation in the MIT economics department, right? The optimal portfolio problem is not posed in isolation from the consumption planning problem. It is, the, it is the parallel to the optimal consumption problem. So in some sense, you've taken you know, Ramsey's interest in optimal lifetime or consumption planning. You've brought in the stochastic structure. You've brought in the fact that there are many different assets to hold, and then asked the question, well, what do you do? Okay, well, that's a very hard problem to solve, but it's a problem that no one coming from an economics or a macroeconomic background can deny is absolutely central to that field because you're trying to understand the determinants of consumption behavior in a world where you've also got this rich menu of financial assets that are available uh, for you to, to think about holding. And I mean, the, you see the same theme as you move forward from the early 1970s and the, the, the JET paper uh, and the Lifetime Portfolio Selection Under Uncertainty paper move forward to the mid-1980s, uh, and Bob has a remarkable paper uh, that's actually in, a, it's in an NBER conference volume that was edited by Zvi, and it's on the theory of optimal social security. Okay? And it basically brings, you know, this is, you know, social security is the purview of public finance economists. Public finance economists are not well-versed in the use of the Edo calculus, I, I'm sorry to say. Uh, they're kind of scared when somebody brings the Edo calculus into the discussion. Well, Bob comes to this conference on pensions and says, here's the way you design the optimal social security structure, uh, which basically involves a consumption indexed annuity product, which will be available once you reach retirement. Okay? And what's fascinating about this, and I think I feel fair to point this out, discussion, de debate between two Nobel laureates seems like fair for us to all observe. Peter Diamond has written uh, you know, previously to this work that one of the key missing markets uh, that, that, that Social Security can remedy 
is the absence of an indexed, of, an, of a price level indexed annuity market, right? Anyone who studies the world of, 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 in, of annuity products, uh, inflation indexed annuities are, are, are very rare. Uh, even plain nominal annuities are pretty rare, uh, but, but very few offer inflation protection. One of Bob's points is that that is not the natural riskless security if you're in, uh, in thinking about retirement, that rather you would, it's, it's not the, the natural security you'd want to hold because the theory of lifetime portfolio selection tells you that even in retirement, you want to bear some risk in return for higher return. And consequently, what you would bear is in some sense a little bit of aggregate risk. How would you get that? You'd essentially do it by having a share of what was happening in the aggregate economy as reflected, for example, in aggregate consumption per capita. So, the Mertonian recommendation here is think about a product which would be something like an inflation, like, like a real consumption indexed retirement stream, and then ask the question, how are you going to be able to develop and produce that kind of an instrument? Okay? And I'm not going to steal Arun's thunder since he's going to talk more about that this afternoon, but stay tuned, that's coming. Uh, but it's that 1984 paper which lays out a key part of how you would think about this retirement system in an optimizing world. Right? It's, it's bringing the optimization framework to think about that context, very much a, a real economics context. Fast forward another 10 or 15 years. Uh, Bob is one of the first people to point out that in the private sector, defined benefit pension plans, which by the late 1990s are beginning to wither, are not coming back anytime soon, that they fundamentally were underpriced when they were offered in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, that the firms offering them didn't quite understand what the risks were in those products, and consequently, you either had to get firms to pay a lot more for them or reconcile yourself to the fact that you were moving to a different environment, like the defined contribution world that we live in today. Bob also recognized that, and here I, I bring Zvi into the, into the tag team of this, that the defined contribution world, which in some sense, in the, you know, when the baby boomers were in the labor force primarily, was focused on how much can you accumulate in the account, the defined contribution account as you approach retirement, that that was kind of asking the wrong question. Because the right question, the, the, wrong que the right question was, what can you purchase in terms of the stream of income or the stream of consumption that you will be able to, to live on in retirement, right? And that Unless you had fully Im, you know, Im, imbibed the, the lessons of Mertonian, Mertonian changes in the, in the opportunity set for investments from the 1971 paper, just knowing the wealth you had did not answer the question of what you could buy as a retirement stream. So you needed to think about the way in which you would transform the wealth at retirement into a stream of consumption that you could live on in your, in your retirement years. Okay? And that fundamental insight the one needed in some sense to bring the tools of financial economics to redefine what is the riskless asset for somebody thinking about consumption is absolutely critical to, to what's happened subsequently, right? Today in the, in, the, in the pension world, we're seeing that as the baby boomers have moved from accumulation phase to now into the early days of retirement and, and thinking about what comes next, right? The, the focus has shifted from what balance can you accumulate by retirement to a what do you do with that balance when you get there? And again, the work that Arun and Bob have been doing on selfies brings a very interesting perspective to thinking about how you want to manage uh, the assets that you've accumulated as you've, as you've run up to, to retirement. So at least for me, uh, the work that Bob has done on intertemporal consumption planning, which then leads to the work on optimal retirement product, uh, it, it is obviously work that brings together the fields of economics and financial economics in a very fundamental way. I think it, it illustrates for, for anyone who's an outside observer the important symbiosis between those two fields, right? Because it shows you how you can use the tools and technologies of financial economics to tackle problems that are very difficult, uh, but very central to thinking about the way in which uh, households might go about their, their problems of consumption planning. All right, second example. Uh, this one's a little bit more off the beaten track. One of the chapters in Bob's dissertation was actually on optimal growth. Okay. Now, those of you who've been around MIT for a while know uh, that it was pretty hard to be a graduate student at MIT in the economics department in the 1960s and not write a dissertation on optimal growth. Right? This is what Bob Sola was working on, and Bob's dissertation committee was Paul Samuelson, Bob Sola, and Frank Fisher. Right? No Clark Medal need not apply. Uh, so, you know, basically, this was, a, this was in the air. Okay? And Bob did some work 
uh, the dissertation chapter is actually on <clears throat> what happens if the growth rate of population in the economy depends on wealth per capita. Right? And you can think of various reasons why the level of economic development as measured by wealth per capita might affect, uh, affect the population growth rate. There's a second paper on optimal growth that Bob wrote. It's published in the Review of Economic Studies a few years later. And it's actually bringing the stochastic calculus to bear on the problems of optimal growth. Right? Because all of the solo and solo student work is essentially done in a world of certainty. Right? You know what the growth rate is. You know, you know what the productivity rate, the rate of technological change will be. And you're trying to figure out what the capital stock does and things like that. Bob brings in stochastic population growth, okay? which means that the steady state that generations of economics graduate students have learned how to figure out in the solo model is replaced by a steady state distribution of outcomes, right? a much more complicated object, both mathematically and economically, to work with. Okay? And of course, it opens the door to doing a whole lot of additional work in the theory of optimal growth. Uh, and this is a question, by the way, uh, you know, Jim Murleys, who was a Cambridge-trained mathematician, right, had done the Cambridge tripos in math, was what they call a wrangler in the UK. Uh, he was no mathematical slouch. Uh, Jim Murleys had worked on the problem of optimal growth in the presence of, of shocks during the 1960s as an unpublished paper that Bob cites. But Jim never felt that he kind of got enough traction to be able to, to go forward and publish that paper. Okay? So I asked Bob Solo, uh, why did you know, did stochastic growth not move forward from Bob's 1974 paper? Bob kind of looked off and he said, you know, Jim, I think it was just too hard. <laughs> uh, and I, I mean, as I, I thought given the context here that, you know, uh, option pricing with stochastic calculus was hard too, uh, but it may be that there was more incentive for the financial sector to figure that out than it was for the development economists to figure out optimal stochastic growth in the presence of, of Edo processes for population growth. Uh, but we'll leave that aside. By the way, I, did, I, uh, I emailed Bob Solo this morning. Bob will be celebrating his 95th birthday later this month. Uh, and I said, Bob, I am here celebrating Bob Merton. Uh, and I'll be talking about optimal growth in a, in, in a stochastic economy. And uh, Bob emailed back and said, uh, please, please convey this message to the group. Uh, one of the things that Paul Samuelson and I shared is fondness and admiration for both Bob Mertens, the elder and the younger. He clearly didn't know there were four, but we'll leave that aside. Uh, <laughs> between them, they covered most of the human virtues. To have known them both is serendipity at its best. Uh, so Bob, congratulations from, uh, from Bob Solo. Uh, so the last, uh, the last point that I'll make uh, beyond the optimal, optimal growth is, is contingent claims valuation. Uh, and in some sense, this is another place where you see the tools of financial economics being used to tackle all manner of different economics problems. Right? Now, as a public finance economist, one of the ways I, one of my litmus tests for figuring out where people come from when they think about things like taxes on, on capital and income, capital income is if you talk about the capital gains tax, right, public finance economists will usually focus on the fact that the capital gains tax rate is lower than the ordinary income tax rate that applies to dividends. Financial economists almost invariably point to the embedded options that are provided by a realization-based capital gain system, which enables you to basically decide when you're going to take the gains, when you're going to give, take the losses, and gives you the opportunity to basically optimize against the government as the other player, which pays a, plays a kind of passive hand in this, in this role. And the work that you know, Constantinides and Spat and Bob and others have done points to the fact that when you've got that kind of a structure, uh, the the, the economic consequences of the tax system may turn out to be quite different uh, than the simple analysis that you might do when you think about how taxes would influence uh, portfolio selection and portfolio behavior. And in many cases, uh, the effect of tax burden is much lower when you've got the option to selectively realize uh, than you would think it would be otherwise. Uh, but of course, the notion of contingent claims valuation is something that one finds all over. Right? In, in labor economics, Bob Hall, who was part of the MIT faculty here in the 1970s, uh, has pointed to the decision to hire a worker as fundamentally the decision to exercise an option. 
right? And you, know, you might wait another quarter to hire your worker. And not only is that important for labor economics, it's also fundamental for thinking about economic fluctuations and trying to understand where we see unemployment and, and employment and hiring go over the course of the of the business cycle. And of course, in all manner of different financial claims uh, in, the finan in the banking sector and in financial intermediation, we see the presence of these, uh, of these contingent claims. And you know, it's Bob's paper on corporate debt which lays out the framework for how you think about uh, these, uh, these, the, these, these embedded claims, which provides the guidance for all of us in trying to understand how do we analyze uh, what we see as we, as we look at this. So, all right, well, I'm gonna close uh, with one final theme. Uh, it's again related to economics and finance, and you haven't heard yet today about Bob as a teacher. Okay? We've talked a lot about the research, and we'll do more of that, but one of the things Bob did fundamentally you know, here at MIT and also at Harvard was to be an incredibly effective salesperson for financial economics as a toolkit for studying a wide range of other topics. Okay, and I remember my, my, my wife, Nancy, was a grad student in the, in the MIT Economics Department in the early 80s, took Bob's 15415 course, and was part of, a, of a, a big contingent of graduate students in the econ department who were taking that course because they realized they were learning a set of tools uh, that were going to be useful, whether they were industrial organization economists or finance economists or macroeconomists, this was going to help them do various things that were questions, to, to, to tackle various questions uh, that were going to be on their agendas. Okay? And at that time, and many of you were, were here in that era as PhD students in the, in, in the Sloan School or in the econ department, uh, at that time, if you were taking the finance general exams, uh, one of the jokes that I believe the students told was that, and this was when Fisher Black was also here teaching, that if you were taking this exam, when you looked at the questions, you had to figure out which was Bob's question and which was Fisher's question. Because if it was Bob's question, you knew that the answer was apply contingent claims evaluation. You just had to figure out how to do it. If it was Fisher's question, in fact, Fisher's question was often the same question from year to year. It was just that the answer changed because Fisher changed his mind. <laughs> So, you know, Bob has played a, a, a really central role, I think, in advancing, you know, not just in his, in his research, but in his, in his pedagogy and the work that he has done in bringing students into the field of financial economics, uh, building this bridge between uh, non-financial economics and financial economics, which I think is now a, a very firm and, and well-trod uh, structure. Uh, Bob, it's, it's been an incredible pleasure to, to be your colleague here at MIT for uh, now, you know, we started almost 35 years ago, uh, and I know that there's much continued uh, work at this interface between financial economics and the rest of economics uh, that lies ahead. Uh, Bob is, is not just a researcher, he's an engineer, all right? He provides answers to how will you do things, right? The, the, the consumption indexed annuity stream, uh, the thinking about how you would do swaps between different governments that have different revenue streams and, and different risk profiles. Uh, this is something that economists don't do very much. They don't try to design products or policies. And one of the things that makes Bob and his research so, so influential and so exciting is that he does, right? He goes that extra step and he doesn't say, this is just the research for the journal, uh, but he takes it to the world and he tries to see how you implement and how you, you actually operationalize these concepts. So Bob, you have been a role model for generations of econ graduate students and it's really a pleasure to, to celebrate your accomplishments today. Thank you.